Well, if you guys will open your, your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter 3. This is going to begin a transition period for us as a class. I don't even know why I'm opening mine. I left my glasses at home. So I, I see some blur. I think if, I, if maybe Debbie held it up, I'd probably look at it. So, so what... Uh, Oh. Uh, I know, but not in front of people. Okay. All right. Good morning again. We're in session six, and I said this is going to be a transition period for us because beginning next week, we get real. All of this so far, the six these six sessions is all background information. It's good information, but it's it's foundational information. Beginning next week, as we look, uh, actually, we're going to spend two weeks, this is how important it is, on the church of Laodicea. And then we will get into things that are, and, uh, and things that shall be, according to Revelation 1, but things that are for us. Because we'll start building. And so the second week of Laodicea, we're actually going to look at the church uh, of Laodicea and how it relates to today's world. And then we will get into uh, looking at uh, Matthew 24, the signs that Jesus gave in Luke 21 and Matthew 24 at the Great Temple Discourse and, and the Olivet Discourse. We'll look at those, and we'll see what's going on in the world. We'll look at the nature of what Israel, what their job is, okay, according to Daniel chapter 9. And then we're going to spend probably three or four weeks on the rapture of the church. And the reason why we're going to spend such a detailed, lengthy time is because I want us to be able to talk about it. We're going to look at some different theories. You know, most of us here are probably pre-tribulation rapture people. Uh, but we're going to look at some alternative possibilities. Uh, and I will tell you up front that I'm a pre-tribulation rapture person. But then I'm also open-minded to that it could be pre-wrapped. Now, it definitely is not post-trib. And we will look at that. Uh, because there's there's certain reasons and I'm not going to spoil those. Uh, so the first lesson on rapture on, on the rapture is probably going to be the reasons for why you know the, the, there's a lot of reasons that we can say uh, looking at the scripture logically. So we'll be getting into that uh, probably in September, uh, mid September, later September, and everything else basically after uh, this week we're going to start adding in real world headlines okay remember as I said in the beginning of the first session everything's a journey right so this is the journey we're taking so today we're looking we're going to breeze through these as quickly as possible Sardis <coughs> and Philadelphia and so there there's where they are you see we have a nice little loop going and we remember that the reason why it's in order is because it's prophetic as well Remember, we have our four reasons that we are, um, you know, that Jesus wrote these letters. It's to the church itself. It's, it's to all churches throughout all generations. It's to us individually. And it outlines a prophetic timeline. Because each of these churches represent a certain period of church history. And as you will see, especially in the church of Sardis, uh, not everything is like you think it is. So, Sardis. 700 years prior, it was one of the greatest cities in the world to the time of this, uh, at the time of the writing of, of Revelation. So around, you know, 600 B.C., 700 B.C., it was one of the greatest cities in the entire world. It was situated on a hill, and it was encompassed on three sides by this hill that was about 1,000 foot tall. There was one entrance, okay, and it appeared to be impregnable. It was almost like you couldn't do anything to it. And, and when you think you're not vulnerable, what happens to your attitude? You get cocky. You get cocky. You get arrogant. This is exactly what happened to Sardis. It, they had a sheer cliff, and it was made of clay. But what happens with clay? Anybody ever go down like the intercoastal waterway, and you've got these clay banks? Uh, and you can see it pretty much anywhere. 
but I, I've always noticed it there because they, they dug that intercoastal out, and it's a pretty good cliff there, especially down near Sargent along the intercoastal waterway. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, there's all these little trenches where the water, everybody's seen that, okay? Whether it's, uh, you know, intercoastal or somewhere else, you've seen that when water sits there and it erodes clay, you get these little trenches. Well, if you need to climb up a cliff, those little trenches have a lot of old footholds. So there were occasional cracks and they could be exploited. Right. But when you know you're vulnerable, you're not as arrogant. But when you become arrogant, what happens? You, you, don't, think about, you don't think about these little things. Okay? You don't think about them. So they had false confidence. Then back in 549, the Persians besieged them. Remember Cyrus the Great. These are one of the cities in Turkey where he went into to try to take over. They were so arrogant that they didn't even guard those other three walls. You can't climb up these cliffs. Now, why is this important? We will see. And it's amazing because once again, remember what I said about God raising up churches to fit illustrations. It's amazing. And you're going to see this. Uh, well, Cyrus offered a reward to anybody who could figure out how to go around the backside. Because the front side was so guarded. They knew that that was going to be a long siege. But how do you do it? Well, you kind of create a Trojan. You can do a Trojan horse. Or, you know, anybody seen Troy or read the, read the novel uh, by Homer? Is it Homer? Or whoever wrote the Iliad? And you can come in deceitfully that way. Or you could try to sneak in, which is what happened to Babylon. The Medes, they snuck in under the wall from the river at night. Mm. Remember, remember, and I think it's uh, Daniel chapter 5, many, many Tikalu Farson. Okay, right. the handwriting on the wall. You know, your kingdom's going to fall this night. Well, that's how the Medes and Persians did it. They snuck in. Well, that's what Cyrus wanted to do here. He's like, well, you know what? This, happened, this worked before. Remember, all in context. He, they had done this. To the Babylonians. So now they're seeking to do it again. But there's no rivers on top of a mountain. So Herodias, or Herodes, I should say, he, he was out there. He's one of Cyrus's troops. And he watched his soldier bend over the wall. Even though it wasn't guarded, they had a couple of guys walking. And a guy's helmet fell off. Well, what he did was he watched that guy go retrieve his helmet. Because it rolled all the way down the cliff. And so he watched how that guy walked, the, the path that had been eroded. The soldiers of Sardis knew. They had little shortcuts. Now, if you guys have land and you've been on people with, you know, you know people with land, you got all sorts of little shortcuts you can take, right? Well, this is a shoulder, this soldier took a shortcut. And so this Medes and Persians soldier watched him go down and retrieve his helmet and then go back up. Now he knew this is how we can sneak in. And so he went and told Cyrus. So that's important, and we'll see why in a minute. Okay. The name means renewal. Sardis. It means renewal. To, to, to take something that is old and refurbish it. Now, think about that when we talk about church prophecy and, and, and what the Reformation was, because that's what this represents as Reformation. Title. Him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This is interesting. Now, I, I by no means say that these are what the seven spirits are. This is just one of the theories. To me, it seems like a good one. Isaiah 11.2 says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. There's seven. I don't see anywhere else in Scripture that there's seven spirits listed, and it gives them names. So this is the reason why this theory is that these are the seven spirits that John is talking about. Remember how many allusions to the Old Testament are found in the book of Revelation? How many? close. Somebody said 800. 800. Around 800. 
And that's one of the reasons why we, we want to study the book of Revelation, because it helps us study the Old Testament. Because I guarantee you, this verse here is obscure to most of you until you heard it here. Because this probably points back, we think, to here. So we have seven spirits of the Lord. We have the Lord's spirit. There's a spirit of wisdom. There's a spirit of understanding. There's a spirit of counsel. There's a spirit of might. There's a spirit of knowledge. And there's a spirit of the fear of the Lord. I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and they said that one of the reasons why Christians live fallen lives is they do not understand the fear of the Lord. But the fear of the Lord is something that you have to request. You, you don't just automatically have it. It comes from fellowship with the Lord, but it's also a spirit that the Lord can impart upon you. So one of the things that I have done in the last couple of weeks in my prayer time, is ask the Lord to give me a spirit of fear of Him. Help me to truly understand. Because, you know, knowing that the Holy Spirit is who works within me, I can't do anything on my own. I can't even fear the Lord on my own. Because I am evil. I am a sinner. I'm a corrupted mind. That's the reason why I have to renew my mind. Okay? So, the Lord... He's got to give me... I mean, how many of you, by show of hands, because I think it's probably pretty much everybody here, has prayed for wisdom? Right? You've prayed for the Lord to give you a spirit of wisdom about a situation. You've prayed for Him to give you understanding. You've prayed for Him to give you counsel. You've prayed for His strength, His might in a tough time. You've prayed for Him to help you to know the decision to make. Yeah. We spent we spent a, a, almost a year, didn't we, Lance? Mm -hmm. and, and Bob, about... Praying, you know, for God, for us, all of these things. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us understanding. Give us some counsel. You know, help us to know. <clears throat> so this is what we think this is. Now, interesting thing about Sardis is it had a commendation. Nothing. You know, nothing is something. And Sardis is something is nothing. Not one good word was said about Sardis. Remember, a couple of the churches had not one bad word said about them. They had only good things. And a couple of the churches had no good things said about them, only bad things. And then we had three of the churches that had good and bad. So, it's, common, it's condemnation. Now, this, to me, cuts to the quick. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. In other words, you put on a good show. If people look out, people, outsiders come in and look. If they don't know who you are, you look good. But what you are is a, a corpse. It's literally what it's saying. You've been embalmed real well. You look good sitting in that casket. How many of you have seen that or heard that? Oh, they look so good. <laughs> you know? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, they look so young. They look so they did such a good job on them. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying. Yeah, they did a real good job on you, but you're still you're not getting up doing a jig anytime soon. What'd you say? You still did. So, I want to talk about this for a few minutes. How do we determine if a church is alive? On life support? Or dead, because really those are the three, kind of our three stages. You can either be living, you can have somebody else doing the living for you, be a machine, or you're dead. How do we determine that? What's some good uh, milestones, some good road markers? Okay, prayer. Okay, prayer. That's a good one. I'm All right. What'd you say? Folks getting saved. Folks getting saved. What is our commission? Yeah, getting new members. Yeah. Opening new churches. Starting new churches. Starting new churches. Those are all real good. But let me let me tell you that prayer and, and planting new churches, that is an offshoot of fulfilling the Great Commission. If you're doing that one thing good, all those other things 
come about. So I'm going to give you the most, everybody knows, uh, most of you know here, I'm a church consultant. So if I want to measure where you are here, I need two numbers. I only need two. Huh? <laughs> no. That's good. No. I only need to know two numbers from your church. All right? I need to know, first of all, your, your yearly budget. I want to know how much you budget and spend in a year. These are the first two questions I come, when I come in that I ask somebody. I want to know how much money you spend a year. The next is I want to know how many people did you baptize that were not associated with your church. Okay? A kid from BBS, that's okay. If you had to go out and get them, that shows you're doing your job. If, if they're Nelson Lee's daughter, I don't put this number here. Why? Because if I can't lead my own child to Christ, I got bigger problems than the numbers. I mean, I, if we can't, if the deacon's kids and the Sunday school teacher's kids and the regular attender's children, now it doesn't make their salvation any less important. Okay? But what I'm looking for in this number is how much work did you have to do? Okay? I don't have to do work to leave a child that's been coming here all their life. They were raised in the nursery. So when Anastasia gives her life to Christ or Drusilla, we don't count, I don't count them in this number because that's a given. You know, everybody see what I'm saying? So I need to know your number. Now, so let's say a church has a, a million dollar budget. And they baptized 10. <laughs> Anybody see the formula that we're going for? This is real simple. Okay. It's X equals A divided by B. So what this tells me here is that it takes this church $100,000 to lead one person to Christ. Now, a church that's got a million dollar budget, they probably think they're alive. Right. They're doing real good work. They're doing some cool things. I say they're on life support. Mm -hmm. Because if it takes you a hundred grand, now, let me tell you my number. And so this is, an, this is an indictment on this church because my number here that I look for is anything less than 20000 in that ballpark, give or, take, give or take a standard deviation okay, of error. If you're 21000 I'm going to say you're dead. Okay? But if you're, I look for about twenty dollars to $30,000. Anything between thirty and sixty to seventy. dollars to 70000 ding, 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 ding warning bells start to go off. Anything above 70, you're on life support. You may not be dead because you're, you still are fulfilling the Great Commission, but you're limping along doing it. And you're not doing a real good job. So, that's how we determine. Are you alive, on life support, or dead? Is how well you do and how much money does it cost? I have seen churches that spend two hundred grand on one conversion. Two hundred grand is we want. We, we talk about you know we talk about being efficient with God's money, and we talk about you know this is God's money and we got to do right by it. Is it doing right by God's money when our number one job is to do fulfill the Great Commission, and it takes us a hundred grand to do it? Is that I, I don't think that's right. No. That's a shame. And, and it's not just this church that falls within that shame category. It's pretty much every church today. Okay? I would say it is probably almost every church in this association, at least. And you add the Union Baptist Association, they've got 700 churches there. So now we have almost 800 churches that fall into the shame category. Okay? Because our primary job as a church is to fulfill the Great Commission. Make disciples. All right. Make, other Make other Christians. And we call that reproducing yourself. All right. So those are just some, those are hard numbers. Now, I don't just look at those two numbers and walk away. I look at other things. 
There are other extenuating circumstances that I look at. But that's, that's my baseline that I start with. Because what that number tells me is, where do I need to start digging? Why? There could be a very logical explanation for that. There could be. It could be that they're spending 50% on missions. <laughs> Maybe they're spending 70% on missions. They're sending 700 grand out. Well, i got to kind of take that into account, too. Okay? So that's just a hard, hard uh, rule that I use. Okay. Come on. You can change. Okay, so the counsel they receive. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. I found not found your works complete in the sight of my God. There's a reward for obeying. Clothed in white garments, and your name will never be blotted out of the book of life. I confess his name before my father. Remember what Jesus said? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. Mm -hmm. So that's an award, a reward for obeying. The prophetic fulfillment is the Reformation, and it represents the denominational church. So the period that it covers is from Martin Luther to today, because there are plenty of churches out there that are, that are churches of Sardis. They look real good, but if you feel for a pulse, they're dead. I have seen them. I have worked in them. I have worked for them. We went to a place one time that seated 1,500 to work. To, to try to revitalize them. They had seven people. They had seven very wealthy people who, when we showed up, we determined that they did not want help revitalizing. What they wanted was help filling the pulpit so that they could be preached to. The youngest member was 60, who was the son of one of the oldest members. Seven people. 1,500 seats. Alive or dead? Dead. If you were to drive around outside of a 1,500-seat church, would you think alive or dead? Alive. Dead. Well, that's true. If you're driving by outside and you see, wow, that's a big old church. That must be kicking, man. Nothing. Dead. Application to us as believers. Finish well. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're racing. If you set a world's record for the, you know, if you're running the mile, you could be on a world record pace for the first three laps. And then 100 meters from the, from the finish line, you could pull a hamstring. Doesn't matter how well you started, it matters how well you finish. Okay, here it is. This is what I was alluding to. I will come like a thief, and you will not know the hour that I come against you. And this is, this is kind of what Jesus was saying and what Paul was saying. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You do not know the hour the Son of Man comes. And Paul himself says in 1 Thessalonians 5, you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Well, so this is exactly what Jesus tells Sardis. And when we look at this, we think, okay, well, that's just basically saying the same thing, right? No, because what would happen is in Sardis, remember these, these walls, the outsiders could crawl up these walls in the middle of the night and steal stuff. And there was a phrase in Sardis called, he came like a thief in the night. Basically, he came creeping up the wall, up the clay eroded cliff, and stole stuff and went back down the same way. So when Jesus is saying, I will come like a thief in the night, everybody in the church of Sardis went, uh-oh. They didn't think it was some euphemism. They knew it was for real. Yeah, that guy came like he, 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 was, he, he robbed me two weeks ago. That's, that's what they were thinking. So as we go back to the very first lesson, remember, everything in its context. We could, we could look at this and not even know the context of this, and it, it still means a lot to us, right? Like a thief in the night. Okay, that means we, we understand that. But when we look at it in context, we know that the people at Sardis went, Ooh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Those guys come up these cliffs all the time. You would think they would have stuck somebody on a wall, you know, to stop that, but they didn't. Philadelphia. Okay, there's its current name. It is actually still a town in Turkey. Al Shahir. What they were known for is their wine production. They made good wine. 
And back in uh, 17 AD, they were almost completely destroyed by an earthquake. Now, the earthquake in 17 AD also almost destroyed several other cities, including Sardis. Because this was apparently, uh, it was in the second year of Tiberius Caesar or something like, I can't remember the exact date. But it's a very severe earthquake in that area. And as you guys know, in Turkey, that whole area is very prone to really bad earthquakes. Okay, it's a fault line that goes right through there. Well, it was almost completely destroyed, and they had rebuilt. Remember, in context, this is this is almost you know almost 80 years later. So they had done some rebuilding. Name, the friendly city. Everybody knows this one. We don't, you know. Everybody, if they say Philadelphia, you know that Philadelphia means the friendly city. Now, here's the title that Jesus uses: the Holy One, the True One, who has the keys of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Now, this is an allusion back to Isaiah again. Isaiah 22, 22. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall open. Is there any question that this is what John was talking about? Or, excuse me, what Jesus was talking about? Everybody got, and got that? That's pretty obvious, right? It's, it's pretty close with the seven spirits, but, you know, this is dead on. Jesus is quoting Scripture here. Not only is he speaking Scripture, he's quoting Scripture. And guess what? He's quoting the scripture that he wrote. Remember, who's Jesus? He is the word of God. All right? He is the word of God. So all these centuries before, these seven or eight centuries before, when Isaiah is receiving his prophecy, it's Jesus telling him. And Jesus is referring to himself. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. That's his commendation. You've kept my word and not denied my name. Not a single word in condemnation. And the reason why is because they had kept his commands. They had kept his commands. So, when you keep Jesus' commands, there's really nothing to condemn you about. Hold fast. Hang in there. That was the counsel. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may seize your crown. Well, what crown is he talking about? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, not only me, but also those who loved his appearing. That was one of the things we know about the church of Philadelphia. They were looking for the Lord's return. Mm -hmm. They were ready. They were Because, hey, that God had given them a promise. Jesus said he's coming again. We're looking for it. Guess what? Everyone that's in this church, everyone that's in this room right now, who is eagerly anticipating the Lord's coming, not with any reservations, because, oh, I've got to get my kids raised, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. Let me tell you something. This is what I used to tell her. when I was, I've been looking for the Lord's coming for 30-something years now. What I would tell her is, uh, don't worry about it. She's like, but I want to have kids. I'm like, I know you do. But let me tell you, as soon as that trumpet blows, you ain't got to worry about that. As soon as the Lord says, come up here, all those thoughts and worry, you are not going to be walking around heaven pacing going, Man, I just wish I would have had kids. I just wish that I would have gotten married. I wish that I would have been able to see my youngest kid graduate from... No. Those thoughts, they're gone. So don't worry about them now. Because when it happens, you're going to look at yourself when you get to heaven and go... What was I thinking? I wanted to stay down here for what? You know, I hear all these stories about people, they, they give stories about people going to heaven, you know, and I believe most of them are, are either deceptions or, or they're, you know, bad oxygen. But I've heard some of them, and, and, and I know their, test, their testimony prior, and, and I know the clinical records show that they were dead. And the one thing they all have in common I don't want to go back. You're going to send me back? Wait. No, no. <laughs> because it's such a great place. Right. And that's why we're here. So, to get this crown, you know, there's five crowns. And to get this one, all you got to do is live a life in such a way that you're eager for the, that shows that you're eager for the return of the Lord. The reward for obeying. There will be a pillar in the temple of my God. 
And there's another reward. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dry, those who dwell on the earth. The Church of Philadelphia will be specifically kept out of the tribulation period. When we get into the rapture, we'll talk a lot more about this in terms of is there a partial rapture? Because remember, we have seven churches here, right? Remember the other church that didn't have a, condom, a condemnation was Smyrna. They had nothing but good said about them, but not even they had this promise. To me, that, that opens up the possibility. I'm not saying that it, it is what it is, okay? But it opens up the possibility that God's got a cutoff for that first shot out. We'll go into details with that. I don't necessarily subscribe to that and say, if, if you put a gun in my head and say, tell me, I would say, no, everybody that's a newborn, a believer, a true believer, gets raptured out. But I want to tell you, I've got an open mind here. Because there's a reason why, because all these other churches, they're all Christians. But we, we see that they don't have this. So there's something special about being a church that is like Philadelphia. Prophetic fulfillment is a great awakening, roughly 1730 to the present age. There are churches like this. There are Philadelphian churches in China right now. There are Philadelphian churches in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria. They're all over the world. And there's even some Philadelphia churches in the United States. I can tell you they're few and far between. But there are some. It is Prophetic fulfillment is the missionary church. This is when the church got serious about missions. You know, you do a little church history, you realize that starting in the Great Awakening, especially the United States, started sending out missionaries. You want to know why God raised us up? It wasn't because we were so good and we were a democracy and God wants us to be a republic and not a dictatorship. That is not the reason. The reason is because we sent out missionaries. If it had not been for the United States of America, a lot of the world will still not have been evangelized. Because we got serious about it. And that's why God gave him the promise. This application to us. Keep up the good work of the gospel and do not deny him. I have set before you an open door. As opposed to Laodicea. Remember, we all know this verse. I stand at the, behold, I stand at the door of the knock and knock. Anybody lets me in, I'll come and come in and I'll, I'll drink with him and he'll drink with me. So, what we see here in Philadelphia, though, is the door's already open. Who shuts the door? We do. So what this is saying is Philadelphia had the door wide open for Jesus. No man can shut it. And it reminds me of John 10, 28. I give them to them eternal life and they will never perish. And not one of them will be snatched from my hand. No one can shut that door. When you give your life truly to Christ, and the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit happens, that door is wide open, and not one person can shut it. All right, so we got we got a few minutes. <clears throat> What I want you guys, as we go into Laodicea, I'm going to give you, I want something for you guys to start thinking about something. Okay? This will actually be your homework next week or the week after. I haven't decided. But I want you to start thinking about it. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do is, as a matter of fact, I can show you, because this will really help you. Come on. I say, I don't know why it does that. One of the things that I have done here, and these are all hidden, is I have listed, and I haven't put something to lay out of sea yet, but you guys will get this. I have listed, what are all the names mean? What's the titles? It's commendation, it's condemnation, the council, the promise. What does it mean to the church, and what does it mean to me? And then their prophetic fulfillments. I've listed all of these out. I will get copies made. But here's what I want you guys to start thinking about. I want you to start thinking specifically about this church. First Baptist Church, we're sharing, where you are sitting currently. I want you all to think about where we are. 
Okay? Remember, as I said, there are churches that are 100% Ephesians. There are churches that are 100% Laodiceans. What I want you guys to start thinking about is, what is our breakup? Because there are churches that are 50% Philadelphian and 50% Sardis, and, and or 20 this, 30 this. There's, there's makeup. So one of your assignments is going to be in a couple of weeks. Just sit, sit down and look at this church. And I want you all guys to start thinking about it now. But I don't want you to complete it until we look at Laodicea. And what percentage? Not this class. Okay, I'm talking about, so this is what you can do. In about five minutes, ten minutes, we're going to go in there. I want you to start looking around. Okay, at everybody that's here on a normal Sunday morning. And I want you to start mentally assigning numbers. Okay, how much of our church is made up of Laodiceans? How much, oh, you know what, Miss Gundy, she's a Philadelphian. Everybody okay? Everybody got, you see what I'm going here? All right. That's all I'm going. I ain't going no more. <laughs> so I want you guys to start really thinking about it. And here's why. It's important. It's important to know, you know, it's important to know your health. It's important to know where you are. Why do you take tests? Just to measure your... Y'all are about to start doing a lot of that again. Yeah! You know, all the school teachers. Uh, they're so happy. Can't you see that? Happy? But that's why we do it. To see where we stand. And we have to do that as a church. You know? If we are 60% Ephesian and 40% Philadelphian, then I think we're doing really good. But I don't think that's where we are. So I want you to start looking around, and I want you to start praying about it. So, let's see here. So here's the scripture for the week. I want everybody to really memorize this. Micah 6, 8. One of my favorite scriptures. Okay, most of you are familiar with it. He has told you, old man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? There's three things. To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. That's what the Lord requires of you. So if you guys can memorize this scripture. And for next week, well, like I said, we will look at the church of Laodicea and compare it to the church today. This week assignment, just read the letter to Laodicea. Uh, but this will be, if you want to get a jump start, you can read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. These are the particular passages that we're going to look at two weeks from today. Because we're going to look at the end time church. Because Paul had a lot to say about the end time church. Because he said, there is a day coming where they will not endure sound doctrine. That sound familiar? You ever watch TV? You ever watch some TV preachers? They look like there's not a whole lot of sound doctrine going on sometimes. And they're going to heap on themselves teachers because their ears itch and they need a scratch. They're like a dog. Okay? They're like, oh, I got an itch right here, Pastor. Keep one. Okay? So that's where we stand. Any questions? Anything we want to talk about real quick? Okay. Come as a thief in the night. Don't let anybody climb up that backside of your wall. Always be watching. Always be ready. And know that um, there's a promise for those who are interested and love the fact that Jesus is coming again. I mean, you're already going to get one crown. That's the crown of life because you've got the righteousness of Christ. Now, whether or not the Lord actually puts diamonds in those crowns or jewels in those crowns for every person you lead to Christ, I don't know. All I know is that one day all those crowns are coming off my head and they're going to get cast to this feet. They belong to you. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful. We are thankful that you are our God. Father, as we go out this week, it's my prayer for this class. Lord, that they would do justice. Father, that they would love mercy. And Lord, that they would walk humbly before you as their God. I pray, Lord, that no one, no one 
will be able to take their crown. Father, prepare a way. Make a way in their lives. Lord, I pray for each and every person here today that you would give them opportunities to minister to someone this week. Father, whether it's a fellow church member or if it's an opportunity to share a testimony to someone who does not know you as their God, I pray that you would open up a door of utterance. Father, whether it's a, a, a door that, that leads to some admonition, Father, whether it's a door that leads to some edification, or Father, whether it's a door that leads to salvation, Pray that every one of them will walk wisely and circumspect before the world this week, especially our teachers. Give them patience and speak to their hearts, Father, and help them to show the love of Christ. And may that be our prayer, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.